Thomas, welcome. So Thomas Pellerin Carlin is the director of the Jacques Delors Energy Center at the Paris-based think tank, the Jacques Delors Institute, and works extensively on energy and related issues. Uh, Thomas, can we kick off? Um, your blog last June emphasized the huge potential role of regulation as a driver of climate innovation. Has the six months since, since then shown that Europe and the European Union is exploiting the potential to the full? Uh, so thank you, John, for the invitation. Uh, so since June, what happened? Uh, so the European Commission proposed uh, a set of more than 20 new EU laws, EU regulations and directives uh, that have the potential to literally overhaul the entire electricity, carbon pricing, industry, building, transport sector. So all the big stuff we need to change uh, if we want to uh, ever reach climate neutrality by 2050. Um, a big part actually of the potential uh, for bold climate ambitious regulation that will push for innovation ha have, has been seized actually by the commission. Uh, maybe the greatest example of that is the proposal of the Commission to um, only allow the sale of new cars that are zero emission vehicles by 2035. Uh, and that's, to me, a, a great example of a regulation that is, you know, clear, that is as understandable by everybody from, you know, the, the CEO of a car company uh, to the trade unionist you know, or the consumer. Uh, by 2035, uh, if you want to buy a new car um, on the continent of the European Union, uh, it will be a zero emission vehicle, so most likely a battery electric vehicle. Um, and this is particularly useful because that sends a super clear signal. Uh, and that's one way uh, to boost all the kind of innovation we need uh, in order for the shift to electric cars to actually work. Uh, so, you know, improving the battery, improving the car, charging points, you know, all of that. So you're fairly positive in your assessment then of the progress that's been made. Yeah, yeah. I mean, um, and, and maybe, I mean, if I, if I need to provide some nuance, I mean, uh, uh, you know, um, I'm positive in the sense that we we are far better now in January 2022 than where we were in June 2021. That's for sure. Um, uh, did we reach the point where I'm going to say, okay, don't worry, guys, you know, we, we, we kind of, you know, we're, we're able to fully address uh, the climate concern. Obviously not, we're not there. Uh, so we made, we made a lot of progress. And, uh, but an, an area where uh, stuff are clearly still lacking uh, has to do uh, with um, renovation of buildings, uh, for instance. Uh, so that's one of the newest uh, proposals from the commission. The proposal was uh, published in December. Um, in December 2021, uh, and here there are definitely good steps in the right direction, for instance, regulation that mandates uh, the renovation of privately owned uh, buildings. Uh, but um, the, I mean, when you go into the details of the regulation, you see that it has been watered down uh, somehow and that it's not um, at the level of ambition we needed to be at this stage. Um, now, it's really up to the um, EU democratic process to change those proposals and adopt a version of them um, by 2023, most likely. Uh, and so there are already heavy debates in, um, in the parliament uh, and in the council, uh, so between national governments, uh, in order to see you know, what, should, what should be the version of the text that is, um, uh, that is adopted. Uh, and for instance, you know, Emmanuel Macron, the French president, is quite clear that uh, he wants uh, the French car companies to continue to sell oil-powered cars after 2035. Uh, so he's opposing, for instance, that particular measure, uh, while other uh, politicians are actually uh, supporting it, or even sometimes asking for an even earlier um, uh, date that would uh, even further boost uh, innovation and the shift to, to electric vehicles. So does this suggest to you that the neoliberal arguments that have dominated in the last four de decades uh, that uh, government and regulations are a roadblock to innovation and enterprise, um, that these arguments are on the retreat or do they still uh, have significant influence? Um, well, it's actually both. They are on the retreat and they still have a significant influence nonetheless. Uh, so they are are to some extent on the retreat because increasingly people, especially inside the commission, 
um, understand that sometimes um, you need regulation to push for innovation. You need regulation to force change uh, inside companies. Uh, and therefore, that regulation can actually be a driver, something positive uh, for, uh, for, climate, um, uh, for climate innovation. Um, this being said, just using the, 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 the example of the regulation on cars again, uh, as, a, as a good example here, um, uh, some politicians uh, from the center and from the right, uh, specifically, are actually saying that, no, 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 we should not mandate only zero emissions vehicles, because otherwise we're going to close the door for innovation, for you know, a new type of um, uh, somehow green fossil fuel made from you know, whatever. Uh, and so this is still an argument that is being used. Uh, so and, and here we, we still see this uh, political narrative of using innovation as a distraction. Uh, so those politicians that use the term innovation to say, don't worry, guys, somehow, you know, um, uh, in the future, uh, technology will save us all. Uh, don't worry, don't be too pushy. Everything's going to be fine. We still see that narrative now, uh, which uh, is on the retreat, but still is, is quite prevalent in a, in a big part. Um, of the political spectrum in Europe and therefore also inside the Commission, inside national governments, inside the, uh, uh, the European Parliament. Uh, this being said, I see increasingly a, a higher number of people that are saying, no, 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 uh, innovation is not a bad, it's not supposed to be a distraction. Innovation is about action. Uh, if you want innovation to occur, you need, you know, people to do that. Uh, so you need researchers, you need innovators, you need investors, you need workers, uh, and you need them you know, to give them uh, the money, the money, or you know, the particular framework uh, that will you know give them the freedom uh, to to test, to fail, and then hopefully for some of them to actually find the kind of innovation we need uh, to to ensure you know a humane way to, to target the climate crisis. Do you see? Can I, can I just come in, John? I mean, can I press you, Thomas, on the yeah. ambition and time scale, particularly of the two examples you've given? It seems to me the post COP26 context has put a lot of pressure on doing something by 2030 to avoid just getting bogged down in the long term, uh, in Greta's words, blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. Now, 2035 on the cars is a long way off. Um, a regulation next year on renovation across Europe could deliver serious achievements by 2030. How do you think we can balance this issue of ambition and time scale? Mm. Um, yeah, that's, that, that's a good point. Um, so the, the, the name of this package in Brussels is called the Feed for 55. That's the, the, the official name they, they, they've given to that package of 20 proposals. Um, and the reason why they chose that, that term is to refer to the EU target to reduce um, greenhouse gas emissions in, in the EU uh, by 55% by 2030. Um, and among many others, I was one of the researchers that was telling them that that's actually a very, very bad objective for that package to follow. Uh, and the reason has everything to do with the way the EU works. Uh, the European Union um, is... Um, you know, um, a political body that has a very lengthy and very democratic process for decision making. Uh, and then that requires a lot of time to take a decision and then for that decision to be implemented. So to me, really, um, uh, there are very few tools that the European Union can, can use in order to have an impact in the year 2030. However, 2035, definitely, 2040 also. And that's why most of my focus has, has been really with the, uh, uh, on that. This does not mean that we Europeans should not do stuff. It means that it's a, it's a different kind of level of governance uh, than they need to step in. Uh, and you know, that's you know, local, national, et cetera, all, all of those. Um, but since in Europe, we do that in the specific democratic process of the EU, it means that anything we propose today will at best be uh, adopted in 2023. Uh, if it's a directive, it needs to be transposed by member state in national law. At best, it's 2025. Uh, and you know how many years we need to build a wind turbine? Uh, you know, six years. Uh, so we're already in 2031. Um, so to me, uh, the purpose of the EU should not be about those kind of you know, short-term uh, climate objective. And, and 2030 is very short-term from a climate perspective. Uh, it should be uh, to look after that, to look at what are the kind of stuff we need, not only to get the 2030 target right, but to be on what is really the end game here, uh, which is a path to, to, to climate neutrality. 
it, it clearly a lot of people felt that the post pandemic situation would breathe new life into a more social democratic social market reorientation politically in Europe. I mean, has this got short term potential or, or do you think this is not is over optimistic? Um, I mean, so, so, so here, I guess I'm talking more as a, as a citizen than as a researcher, to be honest. Uh, I, I think this really plays more at the national level. Um, so, for instance, um, we know that the people who pollute the more are the, are the wealthiest people. Um, um, so, that, I mean, this has been clearly demonstrated time and again. Um, one thing that you can't really do politically, but that can be done at the national level, is, for instance, uh, to ban uh, air travel for between whatever destination. Uh, if there is an option that you can do, for instance, using your train in four hours, which is like decent. Uh, and, you know, this is something that at the national level can definitely be done. Uh, and we know that this would uh, more importantly impact the wealthier people because the people that take the train tend to be the wealthier people. Um, then, and so that's definitely, you know, one thing that uh, that can be done and that can be also fostered uh, by, by the pandemic because we've, uh, we've been traveling less. Uh, and also we are more ready, uh, hopefully, uh, to accept um, restrictions to freedoms. And I would put that with big brackets uh, of very specific uh, specific freedoms uh, for the sake of the common good. Um, and therefore, you know, the, the freedom for people to take the plane just to go on a weekend for tourism uh, at the expense of our future is maybe the kind of, the, the kind of specific freedom we don't we don't need that much uh, in, uh, uh, in this century. Uh, so that's for, let's say, the um, one side of the equation. Then the second side of the equation would be, you know, which kind of policies actually can ensure um, inclusivity and, and, you know, social progress. Uh, and here, uh, you know, uh, the national level here again uh, can really step in. Um, I mean, one thing we've been arguing in favor of uh, for the EU to do, but also the national level to act upon uh, is the issue of um, uh, what academics call energy poverty. Uh, so therefore, a situation where people uh, essentially don't have the ability to afford uh, basic energy services, uh, such as, you know, heating one's home decently uh, in the winter. Uh, we have the technologies to solve that problem, that's housing uh, renovation. <laughs> uh, that's very simple. We know how to do that. Um, it requires a bit of money, but not that much. Uh, if the state does it, then you save a, a ton of money. Uh, because of a positive decrease of public health spending, because people just stop getting as sick as they are um, uh, currently. Um, and those are stuff that we absolutely must do. Um, some countries did a version of that uh, to some extent uh, through the recovery programs that they adopted in, uh, in the middle of the crisis. There was a bit more money in France and in Italy, for instance, going into housing renovation for the benefit uh, of, of Europe um, uh, poorest families. Uh, but definitely, I mean, we should, I mean, uh, we can, and I think we should do more. Um, and just maybe to put a, a few a few figures here. Um, currently, the estimate is that uh, we've got um, around 30 million Europeans, uh, so EU citizens, uh, that are experiencing energy poverty. Um, technically speaking, I mean, we can lift each one of them from energy poverty in the next five to 10 years, depending on our political will. And that's something we should definitely do. Uh, that would be positive for the climate uh, because those people would be consuming less energy and consuming clean energy. Um, that would be beneficial in terms of public health um, uh, and that would be beneficial, you know, first and foremost to them so they can have, you know, a decent life. Uh, so, you know, if I were uh, openly advising social democratic parties to me, you know, that would be kind of the number one stuff they should actually fight for. Uh, when it comes to ensuring a, a just transition to, to climate neutrality, to make sure that the people that have the least privilege in our society are the first winners uh, of, the, uh, of the transition, uh, and that we kind of, you know, use the transition as a way uh, to um, help them stop being the victim of the fossil fuel system that put them uh, in the situation where they are today, where they can't properly heat their homes in the winter, especially uh, this winter. Uh, with the very high gas prices that we've been having in Europe. So that's a, that's a way in which you conceive of bringing the ecological, the environmental and the social transition that's yeah. required together, bringing those Absolutely, elements yes. 
together. Um, how uneven is it? Is the embrace of this interventionist regulatory agenda uh, between the member states? Um, you get a sense of um, obviously the new German government is very positive on this, but this isn't necessarily reflected with uh, other parts of the union. Um, yeah, so I mean, it's, it, I, it's a bit difficult to me to give a, a general answer because it will depend on each file. Um, so, for instance, um, uh, the current French government thinks that um, uh, phasing out the sale of oil powered cars by 2035 is too interventionist. Uh, um, while the German government, to my knowledge at least, seems to be okay with that. Um, but on another file, uh, which is the creation of a second uh, European carbon market that would increase the price of uh, gasoline and of uh, residential fossil fuel, uh, so uh, uh, oil heating and gas heating, uh, the French government is currently opposed and, 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 and the German government is actually in favor of that particular intervention, uh, which is a very, very socially unfair way <laughs> Uh, to do uh, to do a transition because you essentially I mean depending on how, how high the price gets uh, we may even see a doubling or a tripling uh, of the price of heating in Europe uh, in in the next five years if that is actually implemented uh, which would be you know something that would disproportionately affect the poorest in our um, in our in yeah in um, in Europe um, and it would be especially be affecting the the people that are tenants, uh, the people with are actually renting a, a house that will pay for the higher heating bill without having any kind of legal capacity to do anything about it because they can't change you know the heating system or they can't renovate the home. That's the the homeowner's um, uh, decision to uh, to do that. Um, so so to me, I mean, I don't really see particular countries that are. Uh, particularly um, in favor of uh, such an interventionist agenda, with, with, maybe with the exception of Spain. Uh, so Spain would be uh, one of the government that is the more, uh, the most pushy in favor of uh, uh, ambitious regulation generally across the board. Uh, but that would kind of be this ex exception. Then it would really depend on specific files. Uh, even the Swedes, for instance, uh, Sweden is very, very, uh, pushing in terms of having climate uh, ambition and climate regulation on uh, the industry, on the electricity sector, uh, but not on the forestry and not on biomass because it apparently hurts uh, some lobbies uh, back in uh, back in Sweden. Fred, you got a final question? Yeah, I mean, I'm interested that I think you're. It, it's persuasive that the national government level is going to remain critical for significant steps in the near term. I suppose there's a big question still in my mind as to how Europe helps with that process, um, because the traditional mode is, well, top down suggestions, bottom up responses and a sort of lowest common denominator outcome. Um, and I wonder if there are any ways around this. I mean, an obvious possibility is, a, is in some way using the European public in a wider sense mm -hmm. as more prominent actors in this. Now, <laughs> this is difficult territory, but I find it difficult to conceive of a significant change on the two, 2030 timetable without some new uh, conversation between the European mm -hmm. public and the European uh, commission and union institutions. I mean, have you got any thoughts on that? Um, yeah, so let me maybe provide a, a two-step uh, two answer. Um, so let's first address the issue of, um, I mean, I'm going to use my words, of the issue of multi-level governance. So, so who does what? Um, and then address the issue of democratic participation. Uh, when it comes to multi-level governance, I mean, to me, um, I mean, Addressing the climate challenges is something that is so complex and requires such a diversity of actions that you need to have a good articulation of all levels of governance, uh, from the most local to the most European. Uh, and this is true even on a single topic. Let's take you know, one concrete example. Um, uh, currently, I mean, we, we need people to use more public transport, but we also need to clean up the public transport that we have. So we need to go from oil buses to electric buses. Yeah. Um, in the end, the actor that will make that shift uh, will be a local community 
it would be a city that would say, okay, I'm going to stop having um, oil powered buses. I'm going to go for electric buses, like the city of Warsaw uh, in Poland is currently doing. And they're quite advanced uh, uh, on, on that far more than most European cities. Uh, so, of course, you need the local level there. Um, who's going to provide the funding? Uh, could be the local level, uh, especially in the most decentralized countries like Germany, could be. Uh, in countries that are more centralized, like mine in France, uh, you should have some national support to do that. Um, you should also have national support uh, in order to ensure that you have an electricity grid that is able to deliver electricity to those new areas, which would be essentially the, uh, you know, the warehouses where you will charge those, uh, those electric buses. And then when it comes to the EU level, uh, you need actually a lot of EU action to do that. Uh, the cost of the electric bus is, has mostly everything to do, a lot to do at least, with the cost of the battery. Uh, and so you need to have uh, big gigafactories in Europe 15 or 20 overall uh, that are able to produce uh, those, those batteries um, in a way that is uh, cheap. And for that, you need to have uh, a form of European uh, industrial policy, uh, which, uh, which is already nascent on that field. Uh, it's called the European Battery Alliance, uh, which is a kind of uh, yeah, uh, 21st century uh, uh, industrial policy uh, on that particular topic. Uh, but you also want to make sure that those batteries are as green as one can get. Uh, and climate is not the only environmental problem we face. Uh, we have problem of access to raw materials. Uh, we have problems of waste, uh, of pollution of water, soil pollution, et cetera. Uh, so you also need the EU to have a, 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 a very tough standard and regulation uh, on batteries to make sure that by design, batteries are gonna use the least amount of raw materials that is needed. Uh, and that by design, the battery will be easily uh, recyclable uh, in you know, 15 or 20 years, whenever we can uh, recycle that battery. And this needs to happen at the EU level, um, uh, mostly to provide you know, a single standard for the entire EU, uh, and hopefully a single standard for the entire world, uh, because that would be, uh, at least when it comes to recycling batteries, the best way to, to address uh, that problem and make sure that while we solve climate change, uh, we try to mitigate the environmental harm that we can do on other uh, topics uh, such as uh, you know waste management, uh, access to materials, um, etc. So just you know using that example, and you, we can you know think about that for you know whatever topic really offshore wind, green steel, whatever. Uh, but you always need to have the interaction between the different level of governance, uh, and and the EU is almost always relevant at some point, uh, especially when it comes to regulation, uh, setting standards, etc. The national level is almost always uh, important. Uh, especially when it comes to the money, uh, because that's where the money is. Uh, public money is at the national level, far more than at the EU, at the local level. Uh, and the local level is always important because in the end, uh, to do this right, right uh, we, we need to um, you know, change the life of the people, you know, the real life of real people in real territories. Uh, and this requires uh, some uh, local level action and adaptation to make sure that a specific solution makes sense for the people that are living in that particular territory in that particular moment in time. So that Thomas, would be my answer to that. Yeah. Thomas, I think we'll bring it to a close there. Okay. I'd just like to thank you for both explaining the interrelationship in the in the climate change agenda between the, the local, national and uh, European levels, their interrelationship, their interconnections, and the, the growing role that regulation plays in trying to tackle some of these questions, whether it's with regard to uh, transport and electric vehicles or the uh, decarbonisation uh, and improvements of energy efficiency within the housing stock and the industrial, the building stock uh, across Europe. And I think you've shown how uh, the European Union is moving in a stronger, more regulatory direction. And I think that might help to convince some of those who may be a little bit sceptic, sceptical about this uh, within the tipsy uh, community. Um, you want to have a final word on citizen consultations, yeah? Yeah, yeah, absolutely, sir. Um, something that has been new is that for the past two or three years, a couple of countries in Europe um, have been um, trying new ways uh, to deliver, you know, climate-friendly policy making. Um, and so they started in Ireland uh, with a citizen consultation where randomly selected Irish citizens uh, had time to debate and come up uh, with uh, climate policies they wanted to implement in Ireland. 
Uh, we had also another experience in France, led by the government, in Germany, led by civil society, and now we've got Spain and Austria going for that. And to me, that's something we really need to watch for. Uh, the experience that I had with the French system consultation was that if you give time to people, and those were randomly selected people, people that are you know, really representative of uh, the French citizenry here, when you give them time, you give them information, you give them time to make up their minds and to debate, in the end, what they came up with was the most ambitious climate proposal I've ever seen in French history. And to me, that gives me a lot of hope that actually democracy is not something that is a problem to address the climate challenge. It's actually something that we need to seize a force uh, that we need to channel towards solving the, 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 the climate challenge. And that the more democratic we are, the more likely we will be uh, to survive the 21st century. Thomas, that's a very good note on which to end. Uh, thank you very much indeed. And I'm sure that will be a real benefit to the participants at the Tipsy Conference. Thank you.